Who isn't obsessed with the red dress that Mina Harker wears in Dracula 1992? Since I've already tackled my dream dress, the Moulin Rouge dress, I figure why not continue the tradition of making a dream red dress from pop culture? So join me on my journey to make Mina Harker's red dress. Hello, my book hoes. I am filming in the office today because I literally need to leave really soon to go on Christmas vacation. But first, let's talk Dracula 1992 costumes. So you've probably already caught my video where I actually took a little field trip to Coppola Vineyard and saw some of the actual film news costumes on display there. And you know, I have been raving about Aiko Ishioka's costume design for a second. So why not tackle the iconic red dress? Today, I'm just gonna be walking you through the basics of me building this dress. If you actually have patterning questions, I would be down to do a little basic flat patterning tutorial showing you how I turned a flat pattern for a bodice into the Dracula bodice and how I modify a sleeve. Specifically, I will tell you the tips I learned in the process of doing this that I would do differently the next time. But that's only if people really want the patterning info. So not only did I watch this movie a bunch of times and, you know, look for photos, I used the Costumer's Guide to Movie Costumes because that's like my holy grail of costume resources, especially for my childhood favorite films. But I also checked out some books from the library that were all about the Dracula production and costumes. This book in particular is focused on the costumes and specifically um, Ishioka and Coppola talking to each other in a bunch of interviews. There is a kind of iconic full spread of the photos of the red bustle dress. Um, these are photos that you see. I think these are the kind of most popular ones in terms of the detail shots that I have seen circulated online. And of this dress, she says, As for Mina, she has changed completely here. Throughout the film, red is significant as a color that symbolizes blood. I decided to use red only for Dracula. The only other time I used red was for the dress Mina wears when she dances with Dracula on their first date. Dracula has this dress specially made for Mina. The object of his passionate love for this dress, he has chosen his theme color. It suggests that Mina will soon turn into a vampire. There are a bunch of really important cool quotes in all of these um, about the importance of the costumes, um, including a lot from Coppola himself. He says, my idea, is to cast these incredible, beautiful young actors and give them incredible drapes and clothes and things that have so much of the emotion right in the fabric. All you have to do is have a big empty space behind them. That's what I mean when I say the costumes are the set. So he's in this, you can tell that he was really obsessed with the idea of the costumes at the set, which is why there was such importance on getting this really um, intentional costume design and why it was so over the top and so beautifully done. Anyway, I highly encourage you to check out the cool Dracula books that exist if you also wanted to know a little bit more about the making of this movie and the behind the scenes of the costumes. In terms of the things that I used to make this dress, I started with foundational garments that I've had for other things except for the bodice. So specifically the skirts, I had a bunch of underskirts that I've used for Victorian bustle dresses. And then I had a phantom bustle that I made in the Laced Angels phantom bustle class from GBACG a few years back. For the bodice, I don't use foundational garments. I think if you watch the movie and see um, the bodice design and the way that the actresses move in them, it seems like the bodices are the structured thing, that they aren't really corseted for the most part. For me, like looking at the dart placement and the ways that the bodices are cut, it seems like those were also built from modern blocks to look Victorian, which is why I did what I did to just modify a bodice block to fit the silhouette. In terms of actual materials, I used 10 yards. I don't know the width of the yardage, but I used 10 yards of a poly taffeta that I got for like $2.99 a yard at my local fabric store, Fabrics. It's a dead stock store in San Francisco, and I highly suggest you check it out because it literally just salvages stuff that was going to go to the trash. I think that's enough background information. Let's get into the making of this dress. We start where all good costume builds start, which is the mock up phase. I used a black muslin that I got from Mood to make the mock-up for the bodice. Once I fiddled with it and was happy with it, I then used the black bodice fabric to be my pattern, my modified pattern, and to be the lining because I just need to make one modification in the back and it was good. So then you're seeing me use some basic bias tape that I bought in the fabric district to make boning channels because I'm gonna put boning channels on my lining uh, layer so that it will be on the inside um, and my bodice will have some basic 
really, really basic boning. Um, I am using some heavy duty zip ties for the boning here, but all I'm really doing is just putting in some channels to slip that boning in. So once I sew the channel itself, which is leaving the short seam line at the bottom, the hemline, um, unsewn, I can then move on with this build and um, put this, attach this to the um, self, the outer, the red fabric. But you see here that I just go up and down and then I am using red thread because it was already in my machine. This part is probably the hardest, which is aligning the um, fashion fabric layers to the lining layers. And because it is a um, crossover in the front and the back, there's just a lot of, I don't know, not mental math, but like in your head figuring out what goes where. So just be very aware of that. So here you can see that I finally got all that together and then I pinned so many pens, so many pens. I pinned the kind of quote outsides to the outsides here um, so that I can sew along the edge and then I will turn that inside out so it's a nice finished edge. Um, and you can see here's just so many pens. But before I sew part of this, I do need to make sure that I have the boning cut for this. So I do take the time. I see, okay, this is where the boning ends. I don't use Sharpie on these to mark where they end. Um, I just like hold where it touches the bottom and then I cut using my, um, my kind of heavy duty paper scissors. I cut like half an inch above where the bottom of the fabric is because I know that I need to sew at least that high. So I will just cut that off. I usually round the tip in this stage, um, but also just like triple check that it's the right length. That's gonna fit in there okay. That's not too long. You don't wanna sew over these. I would say my biggest recommendation for sewing along the edges is just taking your time, double checking that like you do have the correct sides facing each other, that you do have the boning in, and that they're in place as you go just because it does take a lot of time and it's a big seam to have to unpick. So I um, wanted to make sure that like that edge is as neat as possible, the outer edge, before I top stitch it, because I do need to top stitch um, where they overlap essentially. So I just have my little tailor's hand, and I'm gonna be steam iron those seams open because I really need them to be open and very crisp. Essentially, like opening them up means that when I fold them. Um, it'll be easier and it'll look nicer. So these sleeves in hindsight should have been modified way better, but here they are and I'm cutting it out of this fashion fabric, but you can see that I tried to do the little, I don't know, petals, but I think they should have been different. Then I cut some of the muslin for the bottom part because I do want it to have a liner, um, but I didn't need it for the whole thing. So then this is just the black muslin on top of this. I figured I'd use the black muslin since I'd already used it for the inside of the dress, so why not? But I just put a little bit in there and you, you know, you'll see it. I just didn't want to be raw edges because this fabric frays. So I'm just going to sew these into the bottom and then I will turn them inside out, iron them really flat. And that's about it for the sleeves. And then you can see here that I'm going to use my little pokey thing to get that uh, corner as nice as I can. Uh, you could have cut the inside of the corner a little bit. You could top stitch these. You should be whatever you want. I decided to just um, go with it because I actually didn't need it to be like super pointy. 
but if you need yours to be super sharp looking, go for it. Cut some of the inside fabric so that it lays flatter. I just uh, ironed uh, the f out of these so that they would be flat. And then I pinned that bottom hem of the bodice together. I sewed up the sleeve inner seam just so that they would be together. And you can see here, everything's going together. Look at it. That's nice. I'm proud. The bodice really didn't need much more work. Um, it just was sewing a couple things down. Um, but I decided that this was, I guess, worth me struggling on camera to show you, which was me using the fork method to make pleats in this massive piece of fabric. So I feel like it was like four yards, three yards um, for just the skirt that's just pleated. It's probably four yards. So it reduced a ton. So what I did for the pleated underskirt, because it's it, the whole skirt's pleated, the whole outer skirt is pleated. And if you look at the skirt in the movie, look at the stills as much as I have, there are um, every so-and-so inches, like there's a stitch that runs along them um, to keep them in place. Obviously, like they used a much more consistent pleater and a better one than my fork method. Uh, but basically, I used the fork method to pleat one side, and then in a second, you will see the method to my madness. So I took this massive piece of fabric that I had pleated, and I took it downstairs, and then I just tried to replicate the pleats through the bottom of the piece of fabric by pinning everything in place, and then I basted everything. This is chaos. This is just chaos. It's pure chaos. Um... <laughs> And I tried to chalk like the line so it'd be in the same place for the whole piece down, like when I sewed it down. Um, but I I ironed it down first before I sewed it down, and I used a vinegar spray, which is actually the same vinegar uh solution that we use to clean the bunny stuff, which is vinegar and water, um, because it's supposed to help maintain pleats. Um, and I just tried to really iron that down. Um, but you can see it doesn't really hold amazingly. It's fine. Anyway, so I draped the skirt. Um, you can see here everything above the waistline I'm going to be cutting off. Um, and I know it's kind of dark in here, but you basically just need to drape it so that it does meet the hem in the front. And then I just pulled it down the back for some body and shaping and stuff. And all that's going to be coming off. Which is exciting. But I pinned all of that to that tape that you see there, that black um, twill tape. Yeah, you can see some here in the front. The front just needs to lie kind of flat, straight to the ground. And it's the back that needs all the bustling. But I use what's up there on top of the bodice. I use that extra to make a bunch of the flowers. So there you go. Um, and then, yeah, you just <laughs> make sure your pens are exactly where you need them to be because there's no real going back here and then you sew it down so I sew the twill tape in two places at the top at the bottom you can see it there and then I need to sew that one down and then I do the the skirts so it's two ties so the front ties in the back and the back ties in the front and then you know obviously when you put them on you try to off center them but you can see here just oh yeah I enclosed the seam that's what I did to, so I pinned the twill table on the outside and then flipped it. I sewed it and then flipped it, flipped it. And then look, it's pretty together. Like, I didn't film the draping of the um, bustled overskirt, which hides so much of the pleats, whatever. Um, but you know what? I feel like it came together real good. You can see here the pens um, holding some of that shaping in place, which I think is kind of really critical to making that seem a lot more fabric than I had. As frustrating as it is that the pleats didn't hold, I accept that that was my fate.
Isn't it stunning? I think specifically in photos and videos, it doesn't look as bad, like as far as like looking like a polytaffeta. I had a bunch of people actually ask me when I posted photos of it, if it was real silk and I'm just like, no, it wasn't. So I think um, if no one sees it in person, no one will really know how much that is clearly a poly uh, blend fabric, but here we are. So things I didn't film in terms of just this make were a lot of the little detail work, the draping of the bustle and the pinning and sewing that into place. I was literally using an, a big remnant of what I had and trying to drape that into a shape. So it worked out fine. I think it's as good as it's gonna be considering I just got 10 yards. And the petals. So in Mina's dress, they are much smaller and there's a lot more of them. And I didn't have the patience or the time to do that much one-on-one uh, -on -one work. So I decided to make mine a little bit bigger. And I can do like a mini tutorial on that if folks are interested, but this video is already pretty long. So um, I did make 90 uh, red petals in various sizes and shapes um, to make that happen. And then I hand sewed them on and I will probably keep hand stitching them down in a couple of places. Um, but pretty much I cut a square, folded it into two triangles, like folded it once, folded it again, gathered the raw edge, swooped it in and made this little cute petal shape and then knotted that off, cut off the needle and then um, I burned the poly, the raw edge, and it just, you know, melted to itself, just so it wouldn't fry. And with that, I think this is my last really big build of the year. Patrons, thank you so, 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 so much for supporting all of my silly builds and projects and for just being here for the ride. You always get the little previews of all of my work and I appreciate you for just like being a cheer squad, but also, you know, being helpful to each other as well. If you would like to become a patron or leave me a tip on coffee, check out the links in my description. And with that, thank you for joining me and don't forget to make it so.